Hello everyone and welcome to our weekly study group. Ahabante di sarunina saha pancha silani yajami utiampi ahambante di sarunina saha pancha silani yajami tatiampi ahambante di sarunina saha pancha silani yajami Namo tassa bhagavato arahato sama sambuddhasa. 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 Buddham sarana gacchami. Buddham sarana gacchami. Dhammam sarana gacchami. Dhammam sarana gacchami. Sanghaṁ sarana gacchami. Sanghaṁ sarana gacchami. Dutiyam pi buddham saranam gacchami. Dutiyam pi buddham saranam gacchami. Dutiyam pi dhammam saranam gacchami. Dutiyam pi dhammam saranam gacchami. Dutiyam pi sangham saranam gacchami. Dutiyam pi sangham saranam gacchami. Tatiyam pi buddham saranam gacchami. Tatiyam pi buddham saranam gacchami. Tatiyam pi dhamman saranam gacchami. Tatiyam pi dhamman saranam gacchami. Tatiyam pi sangham saranam gacchami. Tatiyam pi sangham saranam gacchami. Isarana gamanam titan. Aham bante. Parati pata vira manasukha padam samadhiya. Anati pata vira manisika padam samadhiya. Adimna dana vira manasukha padam samadhiya. Adina dana vera mani sika padam samadhyami. Kami su mitchatara vera mani sika padam samadhyami. Kami su mitchatara vera mani sika padam samadhyami. Musavada vera mani. Sikhapadam Samadhi. Musavada Vedamani Sikhapadam Samadhi Ami. Surame Ranya Majapamada Kana Vedamani Sikhapadam Samadhi Ami. Surame Ranya Mahapamada Kana Vedamani Sikhapadam Samadhi Ami. Imani pancha sikha padami, sile na sugate nyanti, sile na bhoga sampadami, sile na nibute nyanti, tasma sila ni sudha ni. Sadu, sadu, sadu. Sadu, 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 sadu. We are continuing our study of the Visuddhimaga. And we are on chapter 1, paragraph 102. You can find the link in the chat. Sibitsu Osirit. And before we start, I want to clarify some rules so we have a good experience when we are studying. Everyone, please only read one paragraph, uh, except if it's a very short one, then you can read more. And take your time with reading and read carefully. And slowly, so everyone can follow your words. And after each paragraph, wait before you start reading a few moments so we can process the information 
and maybe the vulnerable wants to add something. And if you have any questions, then if it's related to the paragraph, then you can ask. And if it's not directly related to what we have just read, then please wait until we have reached the hour. Then there will be time for questions. And if you want to be skipped, if you don't want to read today, then please let me know in the chat. This would be Marga, paragraph 102. When it is undertaken, thus virtue of body mocha restraint is enduring. It lasts like a crop well fenced in with branches, and it is not braided by the rubber defilements as a village with well guarded gates is not by thieves. And lost does not leak into his mind, as rain does not into a well-roofed house. For this is said, among the visible objects, sounds, and smells, and tastes, and tangibles, guard the faculties. For when these doors are closed and truly guarded, thieves will not come and raid as paraphilies. And just as with a well-roofed house, no rain comes leaking in, so too, no lust comes leaking in for sure upon a well-developed mind. Paragraph 103. This, however, is the teaching at its very highest. This mind is called quickly transformed. So restraint of the faculties should be undertaken by removing a risen lust with the contemplation of foulness, as was done by the elder Van Gisa soon after he had gone forth. As the elder was wandering for alms, it seems, soon after going forth, lust arose in him on seeing a woman. Thereupon he said to the venerable Ananda, I am a fire with sensual lust, and burning flames consume my mind. In pity tell me, Gotama, how to extinguish it for good. The elder said, You do perceive mistakenly that burning flames consume your mind. Look for no sign of beauty there, but that it is which leads to lust. See foulness there and keep your mind harmoniously concentrated. Formation seen as alien, as ill, not self, so this great lust may be extinguished and no more. Take fire thus ever and again. Uh, the elder expelled his lust and then went on with his arms round. So you do perceive mistakenly. That's fine. It's a fine translation, but, but it, it means a little bit more than that, I guess. It's that it's a, a perversion of perception. It means you are well, you're misperceiving the ugly as beautiful. Well, it's actually not, there's, I mean, there's nothing beautiful there. So it's a misperception. In the beginning, it says that he approached the uh, venerable Ananda, but in the verse, it says, In pity, tell me, Gautama, how to extinguish for good. So. be son of, son of Gautama. In the singular, it says he is son of Gautama. Yeah, it doesn't say that here, but it means the one of Gotama, the the person who is of the Gotama, so could be son of Gotama. But in the Pali that I have, there's no son. It means anybody. Gotama is the clan name. Yes. It's the Buddha's clan, Siddhartha Gotama. So anybody who is a follower of him could be called a, Go, a Gotama. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I have a quick question here in terms of 102 and 103. Um, well, too, when I, when I read it, it sounds like, um, the last is come into the brain from the outer side. This makes sense to me that, uh, desire and lust could be originated from inside, right? One well, three sounds like, uh, perceived as uh, mistakenly, meaning the external beauty is there, but uh, the inside or internal 
desire, probably that's the root. So mindfulness should be done instead of、uh, guarding the door. Meaning, so my question was, how mindfulness could be practiced at this moment to guard the door or to pay attention to? Internal desire or lust, not just、uh, paying attention to the external beauty or something. Well, you just say lust, lust, or wanting, or liking, liking. You, the, the Buddha mentioned that there are three parts to it. There is the object that is lusted after, seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, or feeling. Then there is the pleasure involved, the pleasant feeling, and then there is the liking of the pleasant feeling or the wanting of the pleasant feeling. Thank you. Hundred and four. Moreover, a bhikkhu who is fulfilling restraint of the faculties should be like the elder Chittagutta, resident in the great cave of Kurana Daka. And like the elder Mahamitta, resident at the great monastery of Koraka, a、uh, hundred and five. In the great cave of Kurana Daka, it seems there was a lovely painting of the renunciation of the seven Buddhas. A number of bhikkhus, wandering about among the dwelling, saw the painting and said. What a lovely painting, venerable sir! The elder said, "For more than sixty years, friends, I have lived in the cave, and I did not know whether there was any painting there or not. Now today I know it through those who have eyes. The elder, it seems, though he had lived there for so long, had never raised his eyes and looked up at the cave, and at the door of his cave." There was a great ironwood tree, and the elder had never looked up at that either. He knew it was in flower when he saw its petals on the ground each year. The king heard of the elder's great virtues, and he sent for him three times, desiring to pay homage to him. When the elder did not go, he had the breasts of all the women with infants in the town bound and sealed off, saying, "As long as the elder does not come, let the children go without milk." Out of compassion for the children, the elder went to Mahagama. When the king heard that he had come, he said. Go and bring the elder in. I shall take the precepts. Having had him brought up into the inner palace, he paid homage to him and provided him with a meal. Then saying, "Today, venerable sir, there is no opportunity. I shall take the precepts tomorrow." He took the elder's bowl. After following him for a little, he paid homage with the queen and turned back. As seven days went by, thus, whether it was the king who paid homage or whether it was the queen, the elder said, "May the king be happy." One hundred and seven. Bikus asked, "Why is it, venerable sir, that whether it is the king who pays the homage or the queen, you say, 'May the king be happy'?" The elder replied, "Friends, I do not notice whether it is the king or the queen." At the end of seven days, when it was found out found that the elder was not happy living there, he dismissed by the he was dismissed by the king. He went back to the great cave at Kuran Kurandaka. When it was night, he went out onto his walk. A deity who dwelt in the ironwood tree stood with a torch of sticks. Then his meditation subject became quite clear and plain. The elder thinking, "How clear my meditation subject is today," was glad, and immediately after the middle watch, he reached Arahantship, making the whole rock resound. This is a great story for telling to meditators.
or for us as meditators, but considering uh, often in the meditation center there are beautiful flowering trees and you know, just beautiful buildings and so on. So the, the good meditator is the one who never even sees them and only knows the trees are flowering because they see the flowers on the ground. 108. So when another clansman seeks his own good, let him not be hungry-eyed like a monkey in the groves, like a wild deer in the woods, like a nervous little child. Let him go with eyes downcast, seeing a plug yoke sling before, that he fall not in the power of the forest monkey mind. Paragraph 109. The elder Mahamitta's mother was sick with a palsy tumor. She told her daughter, who was a bhikkhuni, had also gone forth. Lady, go to your brother, tell him my trouble and bring back some medicine. She went and told him. The elder said, I do not know how to gather root medicines and such things and concoct a medicine from them. But rather, I'll tell you a medicine. Since I went forth, I have not broken my virtue of restraint of the sense faculties by looking at the bodily form of the opposite sex with a lustful mind. By this declaration of truth, May my mother get well. Go and tell the lady devotee and rub her body. She went and told her what had happened and then did as she had been instructed. At that very moment, the lady devotee's tumor vanished, shrinking away like a lump of froth. She got up and uttered a cry of joy. If the fully enlightened one were still alive, why should he not stroke with his knit adorned hand the head of, of a bhikkhu like my son? So, let another noble clansman gone forth in the dispensation keep, as did the elder Mitta, perfect faculty restraint. 111. See, as restraint of the faculties, is to be undertaken by means of mindfulness. So, livelihood purification is to be undertaken by means of energy. For that, it is accomplished by energy because the abandoning of wrong livelihood is affected in one who has rightly applied energy. Abandoning their unbenefit, unbefitting wrong search, this should be undertaken with energy. By means of the right kind of search, consisting in going on arms, round, etc. Avoiding what is of impure origin as though it were a poisonous snake and using only requisites of pure origin. 112. Herein, for one who has not taken up the ascetic practices, any requisites obtained from the community, from a group of bhikkhus, or from laymen who have confidence in his special qualities of teaching the Dhamma, etc., are called of pure origin. But those obtained on alms round, etc., are of extremely pure origin. For one who has taken up the ascetic practices, those obtained on alms round, etc., and as long as this is in accordance with the rules of the ascetic practices from people who have confidence in his special qualities of asceticism are called of pure origin. And if he has got putrid urine with mixed gold knots and four sweets for the purpose of curing a certain affliction and he eats only the broken gold knots thinking other companions in the life of purity will eat the four sweets. His undertaking of the ascetic practices is 
befitting, for he is then called a bhikkhu, who is supreme in the noble one's heritage. So the ascetic practices, um, not quite clear why he's mentioning them here. Oh, I see, because relating to livelihood, yeah, so relating to livelihood, uh, one who keeps the ascetic practices uh, sort of like a supreme right livelihood. Like the ascetic, there's many ascetic practices that can enhance livelihood or purify livelihood. But the word ascetic practices he's going to use to uh, as a translation for dutanga. Dutanga doesn't actually mean ascetic or anything like that, or even asceticism, but that's that's kind of the idea behind them. Dutanga, duta, dutanga are are sets of strict practices. That's about all they are, strict. I don't know if that's quite what ascetic means, but there's strict practices like only eating alms from alms food, for example, only eating food that, that gets put in your alms bowl, only eating one meal a day, that sort of thing. But we'll, we'll see them, they're coming up. There's a long description of them that you're gonna it's gonna be you're gonna really see the pattern that in this book everything is dissected minutely. Bhante, what does it mean one meal a day? No breakfast. It means well we'll see what it means, but basically it means when it's called um ekasanikanga samadhyami. Ekasanikanga samadhyami. I hereby give up multiple seats. I undertake the practice of one who has only one seat. That's the the wording of it. What that means is you only, when you sit down to eat, you can only eat for as long as you sit there. As soon as you get up, you will not eat for the rest of the day. And it, there's more details, like there's different grades of it and that sort of thing. It, the, it's quite an interesting interesting uh, section. You see lots of different ways of practicing the these uh, strict practices. I see. Thank you. I once took them with Ajahn Tong when he was he was keeping them for the, the rains season, and he taught me how to say them in Pali. Okay, so Dutta means shaken off. Dutanga, that which allows you to shake off your defilements, basically. But the idea is more, I think, like they, they aid in uh, shaking off bad habits. You can get in sort of the habit of complacency when you eat multiple meals or that sort of thing. So Dutanga help you keep your habits pure. 113. As to the robe and the other re requisites, no hint, indication, roundabout talk, or in intimation about robes and arms food is allowable for a bhikkhu who is purifying his livelihood. But a hint, indication, or roundabout talk about the resting place is allowable for one who has not taken up the ascetic practices. Herein, a hint is when one who is getting the pre preparing of the ground, etc., done for the purpose of making a resting place, is asked, What is being done, Venerable Sir? Who is having it done? And he replies, No one or any other such giving of hints, an indication is saying, lay follower, where do you live? In a mansion, venerable sir. But lay follower, a mansion is not allowed for bhikkhus, or any other such giving of indication. Roundabout talk is saying, the resting place for the community of bhikkhus is crowded, or any other such oblique talk. So the idea here is with robes and food, you have to be, there's rules against asking. I, mean, I think a lot of this hinting about, about um, dwellings is also inappropriate, but it's allowed, it's allowable. But the, one of the ascetic practices involves, it's um, yata sanikanga which means you just take whichever dwelling falls to you. Normally you are allowed to 
request a specific dwelling or say, hey, could I stay in that dwelling, that sort of thing. The second one's pretty easy to understand. When the layperson says they live in a mansion, the, the monk out of nowhere says, oh, but monks can't stay in a mansion, hint, hint, hint. Point is, make me a place to stay. Still seems unsuitable un to say such a thing. But the last one I think is okay. If the if the resting place is crowded, unless you're keeping yatasa nikanga, you can say such things like, oh, do you know if there's any place where I might stay? Or could you help me with a place to stay because it's very crowded? So that's reasonable. So in the singing session, it says when the bhikkhu sees the uh, lay people coming, he starts preparing the ground. So like, just for them to see that he's doing something. Maybe that's the hint. Right. I kind of thought about that. But what, like, so that they build him, uh, so maybe so they put a roof over it or something? Oh, I see. Right. So he's preparing a place to stay, and they ask him not what he's doing. They ask, oh, who's building this kuti where you're going to stay, I think? Or who's going to put a roof over this or something like that? And he says, nobody is picking a uh, a suitable place for me to stay so that they say oh we'll do it so all he's doing is preparing to lie down there and they say oh is someone making this going to make this a good place for you to stay I guess it's something like that. or else he he's, he's going to lie outside and rest outside and they say oh you're going to rest here but or like um, you're going to stay here do you have a kuti or something like that? Who's making? who's preparing you a kuti or a place to stay and then he says, nobody is. That seems reasonable as well. So it's probably not, maybe not the case, or it doesn't have to be the case where he's doing it on purpose. He's just saying to himself, well, nobody's giving me a kuti, so I'm just going to lie down here outside. And then when he starts doing that, people come and ask him, oh, is someone preparing you a kuti? And he says, no. He's allowed to say no. But in this case, he's doing that because he saw the people are coming, so he wants to display that he's, he doesn't have a proper place to. Oh, I think it's one who wants to get someone to prepare the ground for the purpose, of, et cetera, for the purpose. It's not one who is getting, one who is looking to get, probably. When people ask them, oh, who is, who is going to do this preparing for you? Let's not take too much time. It's just a weird sort of grammar, I think. Sort of uh, sentence. 115. Uh, all, however, is allowed in the case of medicine. But when the disease is cured, is it or is it not allowed to use the medicine obtained in this way? Here in the Vinaya special, specialists say that the opening has been given by the Blessed One. Therefore, it is allowable. But the Sutanta specialists say that though there is no offense, nevertheless, the livelihood is sullied. Therefore, it is not allowable. But one who does not use hints, indications, roundabout talk, or intimation, though these are permitted by the Blessed One, and one who depends only on the special qualities of fewness of wishes, etc., and makes use only of requisites obtained otherwise than by indication, etc. Even when he thus risks his life, is called supreme in living in effacement like the Venerable Sariputta. It seems that the Venerable One was cultivating seclusion at one time, living in a certain forest with the elder Maha Moggallana. One day an affliction of colic arose in him, causing him great pain. In the evening, the elder Maha Moggallana went to attend upon him. Seeing him lying down, he asked what the reason was, and then he asked, What used to make you better form formerly, friend? The elder said, When I was a layman, friend, my mother used to mix ghee, honey, sugar, and so on, and give me rice gruel with pure milk. That used to make me better. Then the other said, So be it, friend. 
If either you or I have merit, perhaps tomorrow we shall get some. Now a deity who dwelt in a tree at the end of the walk overheard their conversation, thinking, I will find rice gruel for the Lord tomorrow. He went, meanwhile, to the family who was supporting the elder and entered into the body of the eldest son, causing him discomfort. Then he told the assembled relatives the price of the cure. If you prepare rice gruel of such a kind tomorrow for the elder, I will set this one free, they said. Even without being told by you, we regularly supply the elder's needs. And on the following day, they prepared rice gruel of the kind needed. Of actual spirit possession. In this case, uh, by a deva, which is very weird here. I used to think only like not benevolent uh, beings would possess someone. Not this is this is a different case. But we don't know to what extent. It just says it causes him discomfort. It could be anything. The tree deva and the Mara himself caused discomfort to venerable Mongol so They are not strangers uh, to doing evil things. One one nine. The elder Maha Mogalana came in the morning and said, Stay here, friend, till I come back from the alms ground. Then he went into the village. Those people met him. They took his bowl, filled it with the stipulated kind of rice gruel, and gave it back to him. The elder made as though to go, but they said, Eat, venerable sir, we shall give you more. When the elder had eaten, they gave him another bowlful. The elder left. Bringing the alms food to the venerable Sariputta, he said, Here, friend Sariputta, eat. When the elder saw it, he thought, The gruel is very nice. How was it got? And seeing how it had been obtained, he said, Friend, the alms food cannot be used. Oh, and twenty. Instead of thinking he does not eat alms food brought by the likes of me, the other at once took the bowl by the rim and turned it over on one side. As the rice gruel fell on the ground, the elder's affliction vanished. From then on, it did not appear again during forty-five years. Then he said to the venerable Mahamogalana, Friend, even if worms' bowels come out and trail on the ground, it is not fitting to eat gruel got by verbal intimation. And he uttered this exclamation. My livelihood might well be blamed if I were to consent to eat the honey and the gruel obtained by influence of verbal hints. And even if my, if my bowels obtrude and trails outside, and even though my life is to be jeopardized, I will not blot my livelihood, for I will satisfy my heart by shunning all wrong kinds of search, and never will I undertake the search the Buddhas have condemned. 122. And here too should be told the story of the elder Mahatissa, the mango eater, who lived at Jiri Gumba. So, in all respects, a man who has gone forth in faith should purify his livelihood and, seeing clearly, give no thought to any search that is not good. 123. In his livelihood, purification is to be undertaken by means of energy, so virtue dependent on requisites is to be undertaken by means of understanding. For that is accomplished by understanding, because one who possesses understanding is able to see the advantages and the dangers in requisites. So one should abandon greed for requisites and undertake that virtue by using requisites obtained lawfully and properly. After reviewing them with understanding in the way aforesaid, herein, reviewing is of two kinds, at the time of receiving requisites and at the time of using them. For use, Padiboga is blameless and one 
who at the time of receiving ropes, etc., reviews them either as mere elements or as repulsive and puts them aside for later use, and then one who reviews them thus at the time of using them. Here is an explanation to settle the matter. There are four kinds of use. Use as theft, use as debt, use as an inheritance, use as a master. Herein, use by one who is unvirtuous and makes use of requisites, even sitting in the midst of community, is called use as theft. Use without reviewing by one who is virtuous is use as debt. Therefore, the rope should be reviewed and every time it is used, and the alms food lump by lump. One who cannot do this should review it before the meal, after the meal, in the first watch, in the middle watch, and in the last watch. If dawn breaks on him without his having reviewed it, he finds himself in the position of one who has used it as debt. Also, the resting place should be reviewed each time it is used. Recourse to mindfulness is to mindfulness both in the accepting and the use of medicine is proper. But while this is so, though there is an offense for one who uses it without mindfulness after mindful acceptance, there is no offense for one who is mindful and using after accepting without mindfulness. 126. Purification is of four kinds. Purification by the teaching. Purification by restraint. Purification by search and purification by reviewing. Herein, virtue of the Patimoka restraint is called purification by the teaching. For that is so called because it purifies by means of teaching. Virtue of restraint of faculties is called purification. For that is so called because it purifies by means of the restraint in the mental resolution. I shall not do so again. Virtue of livelihood purification is called purification by search. For that is so called because search is purified in one who abandons wrong search and gets requisites lawfully and properly. Virtue dependent on requisites is called purification by reviewing, for that is so called because it purifies by the reviewing of the kind already described. Hence, it was said above, there is no offense for one who is mindful in using after accepting without mindfulness. 127. Use of the requisites by the seven kinds of trainers is called use as an inheritance. For they are the Buddha sense, therefore they make use of the requisites as the heirs of requisites belonging to their father. But how then? Is it the blessed one's requisites or the lighty's requisites that are used? Although given by the light, they actually belong to the blessed one because it is by the blessed one that they are permitted. That is why it should be understood that the plus one's requisites are used. The confirmation here is in the Dhamma Dayata Sutta. Used by those whose cankers are destroyed is called used as a master. For they make use of them as masters because they have escaped 
the slavery of craving. One twenty-eight. As regards this kind of use, use as a master and use as an inheritance are allowable for all. Use as a debt is not allowable. To say nothing of use as theft. But this use of what is revealed by one who is virtuous is use freed from doubt because it is the opposite of use as a debt or is included in use as an inheritance too. For one possessed of virtue is called a trainer too because of possessing this training. As regards these three kinds of use, since use as a master is best. When a bhikkhu undertakes virtue dependent on requisites, he should aspire to that and use them after reviewing them in the way described. And this is said, 45, the truly wise disciple who listens to the Dhamma, as taught by the sublime one, makes use after reviewing of all round and of dwelling and of a resting place and also of the water for washing dirt from robes. So like a drop of water lying on leaves of lotus, a bhikkhu is unsullied by any of these matters, by alms food and by dwelling, and by the resting place and also by the water for washing dirt from robes. Since aid it is and timely procures from another the right amount he reckons, mindful without remitting in chewing and in eating, in tasting food besides, he treats it as an ointment applied upon a wound. Source untraced. So, like the child's flesh in the desert, like the greasing for the axle, he should eat without delusion, nutriment to keep alive. Source and trace. So, if there are any questions now for the text, you can ask. We prioritize the questions from the text, and otherwise, later on, you can ask maybe about your practice or generally about Buddhism. Ante, can you explain what reviewing the requisites mean? There's a whole section on reviewing the requisites. That was what we went over there. Is there something specific? It was 125 that they referred to as explaining the reviewing the requisites, but I don't quite understand what that means. That's the whole, there's a, we went through the section on reviewing. I think they mentioned here the different ways as well, but earlier on that was, but well, this is the fourfold uh, morality. And one of those four is reviewing of the requisites. But there was a whole section on it that we went through. We can maybe go over that. Uh, if you look in 124, it, 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 it briefly mentions them, I think. Reviews them as repulsive. Maybe three. Yeah, so as elements or as repulsive. Those are two ways. But the, earlier on, it was talking about the different ways of being reviewed in requisites, each of the four. Okay, thank you, Bond. So there's actually three ways of reviewing. The one that was discussed in earlier sections, then reviewing as elements, and then reviewing it as repulsive. The Cambodian monastery was that they did all three. Uh, they chanted all three. Um, Bonte, I have a kind of a question about um, the last sentence of 126. Could you please explain this for more details? Well, as it says, there are two ways you can review the requisites. You can review them when they are received, so if someone gives you something, you review it as what you're going to use it for. And 
then you can review it when you actually use it. Mm. It's not enough to review it when you receive it. You have to also review it when you use it. But if you didn't review it when you used it, or when you received it, that's okay. So it, it, we're just saying the most important thing is you review it when you use it. Okay. Makes sense. Thank you. Mm. Bob, do you have a following up question on this? Um, what exactly uh, meaning in terms of reviewing it? Um, does it mean to bring mindfulness in the process? No, it means to reflect. Just, okay. I, I just answered this question. There's three ways to review. So you can go back and read. I know we're, we're, okay. we're not processing the entire text. Um, not every, everybody's not processing it entirely, which is understandable. So you can go back. There's this this section is the the main bulk of it. These four types of sila. So you can sort of go back and figure out what are the four, and then review them on your own. This one is talking about uh, virtue depending on virtue dependent on requisites. But it was already discussed. So this is just referring back to something earlier. Okay. Thank you. If no, you can ask if you have questions about your practice. Or if you have questions in general about Buddhism that could help you in your life. And if there, if there comes up any question about the text, you can just ask again and we will go back to it. Bhante, if we have, for example, a Buddha image on paper or a text with, I don't know, some verse or something from a sutta, it's proper to burn it instead of throwing it away, right? Yeah, that's, that's sort of the acceptable, acceptable way so that it doesn't get trod upon or basically destroy it so it does it can't be um disrespected okay thank you because i wanted to ask why and now answer this question too not there's any reason to do such a thing Aren't uh, bhikkhus allowed to eat uh, in the afternoon if they are sick? Like uh, when Enrico Sariputta was saying that that helped him, but um, I just don't understand why they needed to wait until the next day. Well, we can't eat in the afternoon even if we're sick. Yeah? Oh. Lisa was asking at the Gao, what if the monk is admitted to a hospital? It doesn't change the rules. Okay, so there was there was something like my mother used to mix ghee, honey, and sugar. I remember you saying that that's uh, allowed. Yeah, because those things are special medicines. There's many, many medicines that are allowed outside of the in fact, there's a lot of things that might be considered, well, there's some things that might be considered food that are allowable in the afternoon. For example, sh uh, fruits, medicinal fruits. Some fruits are medicinal and you could use them if you're sick at any time. I know that's a very special case, but would it break the precept if you are being fed through tubes, like on your, through your blood? Uh, well, that wouldn't be food. That would, oh, would it? They will give you electrolytes. Mineral medicines are allowed. Like electrolytes and salts and that sort of thing. If they feed you a meal intravenous, they I don't know. 
Uh, uh, it wouldn't be allowed outside of the. It would be breaking a rule if it was outside of the morning. If the hospital is feeding, uh, like through a Riles tube or something, if the hospital is feeding somebody, they have no say in the matter. So it's not like the individual is taking the food. It's literally being fed to them. So, I mean, it's technically, I don't know how that constitutes breaking a rule if you're not literally, you're not taking the food. It's being forced down a tube. Well, if you're unconscious, maybe. I see. Right. Thank you. I mean, yeah, for sure. If you're unconscious, then you're not responsible for it. No. If you're consenting, it's different. I also try to understand this possession um, situation in the case of uh, the deity. And I don't, I'm just unclear if this, is this an unwholesome action from, from them or? Yes. I thought so, but I, I don't, is it, is it the. That's, that's why it becomes unallowed because it's, it's, you know, it's a, the, the deity manipulated the people. Made them, made them do something that they didn't want to do. I mean, not not it's not actually true because the family said, "Well, we'd give him anyway." But um, the family wouldn't have done it if they hadn't, uh, if they wouldn't have known if the deva hadn't threatened them or it's not threatened. It's uh, stronger than. Hmm. Uh Wanting to uh, give uh, rice gruel to wherever Sariputta, that is awesome. But when the method of uh, obtaining it uh, was unwholesome, and the deity thought of how, how to get it. And when, uh, yeah, if the deity had just said, Hey, the monk needs medicine, <laughs> this, they would say, Oh, that's great. Thank you for letting us know. But mm. I think, I assume. Although on the other hand, uh, it's 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 um, it's not clear because the the section is talking about just actually hinting, or because um, it may actually not be that. It may actually not be because of what the Deva did at all. It's because it came about because Sariputta said what he needed, and it was overheard. So he was just telling Mogalana that, but. He was very austere or very, I think it actually, it's, I'm realizing it might not have been what we thought at all. It's actually simply because he said something and because he said something, he got what he needed. We thought he was only telling another monk, which would mean it wouldn't be wrong to let the monk know. But it turns out he was actually telling, or, or someone who wasn't a monk heard as well, and as a result acted on it. It's interesting. That's right. So, in fact, the the wrongness from a monastic point of view was even less, or even more subtle than than the, the bullying of the the angel. And it's also an example. It's a it's a, it's in that sense a good example of why monks should be careful not to be too uh, conspicuous or too vocal in what they mean, because sometimes it will cause beings to do things irrationally. Telling people about illnesses you have is a funny thing, especially in, in Thailand. You end up with lot as a monk, you end up with lots and lots of medicines. When we went to India, one of the times I went to India, I went with many, many Thai people, and uh, I did get sick. And then suddenly I found uh, myself with two big handfuls of medicine and I had no I said if I were to take all of these I'd probably die. There was so many different kinds of medicine that I was being handed. So we I mean I think I we read that um if the sickness is gone you cannot use it anymore as a monk. So what, yeah, what again I'm I'm not it... quite I'm not quite sure that means exactly because you can't use the medicine anyway. So you can't use medicine unless you're sick anyway. So why would you? I, I don't quite understand. 
It's very subtle, and I don't quite get what it's getting at. In this case, rice gruel, maybe if it is prepared very nicely ah, and right, right, tasty. Right, right. So it's food, and you could, it's still the morning. Suppose you get it in the morning, but then the sickness goes away that morning, and you still eat it. If it went away anyway. Again, because, and the point is, because you, all, you got it by asking for it. So a monk who is sick can ask for food. But suppose he asks for the food, gets the food, but meanwhile, the sickness goes away before he gets a chance to eat it. Can he still eat it? That's clever. Good question. Weird, weird question <laughs> on the top of my head. So, I mean, I was just thinking, like, uh, how come no one, no one could just cure Sariputta or Sariputta himself or Mahamukalana couldn't cure him? But I, I kind of... Remember you mentioning the monk who had this power of healing, I guess, um, nowadays maybe existing one. So I'm I'm just I'm just uh, curious if if there was such a monk uh, in the time of the Buddha who could uh, cure sicknesses. No, I mean I don't know that this monk in modern times actually was able to cure people. I think. He knew some things about medicine and he had some kind of special, or he has some kind of special vision that allows him to diagnose this illness and treat it. But it doesn't mean that it's going to be cured. Yes. The illnesses that are karmically related or related to, yeah, I, I, I could not understand how one can cure that. Some, some sicknesses are caused by karma. Yes. And you can subdue an illness, uh, like uh, by contemplating uh, the Dhamma. I think uh, monks did that, even the Buddha did that. We also read a different uh, example where the bhikkhu was, I think it's curing with the, with the truth or something. Called like that, so his mother got cured, right? Was it Tisa? Not sure. You're talking about where about Angulimala? No, no, we no, just, no. Read, we just okay. read this. Ah, yes, yes. And he said, since I'm a monk, I haven't lusted for the female form or something like that. I can't find it. There's a really funny example in the uh, in the Jatakas, I think about four people so this kid gets bitten by a snake and i remember that story and they're they're all they the go the, the monk i think says says uh, we got to all tell the truth and us telling the truth will hear this and, and it turns out they've all done something pretty pretty shameful but it's all true and so the kid gets better yes the mother says i never loved my husband or something I don't know what the husband says. And the monk says that... He kept a monk who told him for one, the first week, not after that. I think it was the Bodhisattva, right? Yeah, but going back to, to this example with uh, mm -hmm. the monk, actually, with his truth, curing his own mother. So how is that possible? I, only, I thought that, I mean, it's possible to affect your own material properties, right? Like the, the rupa that's connected to you maybe through citta, but uh, like I don't understand how others can influence uh, this on other people's Power body. Power of truth. Power of truth, which is citta still, ultimate reality, no? I mean, Venerable Angulimala did something similar with the uh, I know. Mother of in this case, he he didn't. It, it it's clear, I think, in both cases that it's the it's more the citta of the mother that is affected. Okay. It's affected by how powerful that truth is. It resonates with her on a deep level, and that feels her body. It's also interesting how the. The son and the mother is always connected, even through Chitta then. 
No, it's not through to die. He's, he has to say it to her. Mm -hmm. we, um, yeah, the, he has to tell the mother. It's not his chitta. He tells right. the mother, and she uh, she res she reacts to that. So even in this case, this monk says, to, "I don't know his uh, his sister, right? To go tell my mom this and this, right? So that's how." Yeah, but it's affected by the fact that he hears it and qualities of mind sadha. Mostly. That's great. That's great. I just understood it. Thank you, Bante. Now, how the little boy gets cured from snake bite, I'm not sure. Yeah, but tumors are pretty nasty as well. Like, sure, but the, I don't know. We don't even know if the little boy could he even understand what was being said, or was he even mm -hmm. conscious? I have a question regarding the requesting the Tisarana Bante. So the Pali says aham bante tisarani na saha pancha silani achami i came across a slightly different version in a book let me post that in the chat i was wondering whether you have seen something similar bante yeah that is i think the one that's used uh, in sri lanka no? yeah this is from a single book that's sri lankan people don't usually request right yeah, we don't usually request because like understood that we are sitting there to get, uh, take refuge. But uh, this was uh, mentioned in a book by Venerable Rerukane Chandravimalathera. Well, the reason for requesting is because um, I'm trying to think actually now where it comes from, but there is a jataka where the Buddha says one should only give the precepts to those who ask for them. You shouldn't just go about giving the precepts unless someone actually requests them. I'm not sure if that's the only place where he says that. But in the Jataka, it's, there's a place in the Jataka, if nowhere else, where he says that. And that's one reason, and probably the reason. Can you tell us what, what the, all these means, Sanka? I mean, I don't recognize a few words. This is like uh, requesting little bit uh, more politely, like uh, as a curse, courtesy to us, and, uh, compassion to us, oh. you, you us. I mean, I'm butchering the translation, but <laughs> that's the, just a bit. Oh, what is okasa or anugahang? Anugah means like as a courtesy. As a oh. And okasa, for some reason, I... Kasa, I'm not sure. Kasa means uh, opportunity. Ah, yes, oh, Kasa. Single is what is our Kasa. So that's what you say at the beginning of a request. It's like, in Thai, they actually say, Ka, Oka. Oka is the word. Okasa, they say Oka. So we, it's a very common thing to say in Thai, Ka, Oka. Ka means I request. Or, Please, Okasa means give me the opportunity or, or oh. requesting an opportunity, requesting the opportunity. Sadhu Okasa. And Sadhing is, uh, is with faith, right? No, it just means together. Oh. It's a common word you use after the Tatiya, the, 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 the instrumental case. So Tisarnena Sadding. Sadding will also follow the Ena or the, the, the third case. It means together with together with the oh, yeah. Just means together. There's Saha and Sadding, the two words are identical. So we say it with Saha, but Sadding means the same thing. This this looks very beautiful to me. <laughs> the how it, it is requested. Yeah, it comes from the um, comes from the Vinaya Pitaka. I'm just trying to think if there's something in the, the Samanera ordination that they say that 
to learn data. I'm pretty sure they do actually. It's adapted from the, or maybe not even adapted, but it's the same as in the ordination for the seminary. Yeah, it was mentioned that there are um, monks who heal. Are monks allowed to to heal others? No, uh, not generally speaking. You can you can heal your parents and your immediate relatives, siblings, children. Children, I think, when I'm trying to think of they're even mentioned, but I assume if you had children before you were ordained, they're included. But not um, your your siblings, husbands, or wives can't heal them. But you can give medicine to your sibling to give to the husband or wife, something like that. Is it, is it the, like a Buddhist view that if someone is uh, sick, sick then that's um, I mean uh, there is a reason for that and you shouldn't get involved or something no it's that monks shouldn't be shouldn't work for lay people oh okay it's a real big problem I suppose like here's the example so there's this monk who is very famous for well, there's many monks like this, but there's one monk in America who got very, has gotten very famous for this. And as a result, everyone goes to see him. And how many people instead go to practice meditation? I mean, they do as well, but it's, it reduces the people who are interested in meditation and contacting monks about meditation and focused on meditation. Everyone's all obsessed and going to visit this monk. And that's the idea they get about monks. Oh, monks have this ability and then when other monks say no i'm sorry i can't i can't treat your illnesses what good is this monk right? you know, maybe that monk has some valuable more valuable teachings it's a called corruption of lay people monks have to be very careful not to do these things so i criticized it back when i was there and i mean just mentioned it i think offhand to someone they were quite shocked. And I started arguing with, like debating with me, just polite debate. And it was interesting to hear that people didn't really, they, there was never even this idea that it might be wrong. Oh, and then we had, and then uh, the debate was brought to another monk who was much more politic than I am, or than I was at the time. And he said, uh, I mean, maybe he, he just said, well, maybe he does it out of metta or something like that. He's not doing it out of a desire for for support or something. But I think he, he, he implicitly acknowledged that, yeah, it's not really, it's not precisely speaking accurate, uh, it's not precisely speaking proper, but he's doing it out of kindness. And he, I met him once, he's a very kind monk, so I don't have any, any gripe with him. My only gripe is that, you know, how much support he has gotten and how that could have been better used to build a meditation center. Because he said himself, I, I don't have time to teach meditation because everyone's come to see me about, about their sicknesses. But I, I don't think he was being completely honest when he said that because, of course, he could always just redirect people. Well, is, isn't it a hard thing to choose between, like, if you have some abilities and you can help others with it? Maybe, and um, then you, you just... Do you really think it's helping people, though? Like, if you cure people's physical illness, is that really, really helpful? Well, I think not, but uh, I'm just one person. But, yeah, but you're, think... you're a good, you're a wise Buddhist. So that's the point, is if you're a wise monk, I mean, the, the wisdom is, is well, curing people's illnesses is... I mean, it's, it is good. It's, in a worldly sense, it's good, but it's such a, a, a lower type of good that it's, think, it's a shame that, that they're not doing something better with their time. Yeah, I think it's futile. So, I mean, you right. hear one thing and then there is another thing and another thing and old age. And I mean, if here, here's an example. Here, here's, okay, here's, an, here's a good sort of um, compromise that is actually, I think, worth talking about not very well known 
and acceptable. If someone is practicing meditation, like someone here at Wat Lampung, if someone here at Wat Lampung gets sick, even if they're a lay person, the monks can take care of them. As far as I know, like to the best of my understanding from what I've read, it's allowed because they're they're under our protection. So if they're staying at the monastery, that was one thing I didn't mention. Someone staying at the monastery, we can also give them medicine if they need. So what I mean, so what that leads to is, if someone is practicing meditation, you because you can say, well, what if they're practicing meditation? Then absolutely, curing the illness is a real important thing and has real good. Why? Because it allows them to better practice meditation. So there you go. It is allowed, and that is reasonable and and wise. So a monk who had those abilities could provide the the medicinal services to a lay person, man or woman, although you know, yeah, man or woman who's staying at the monastery with, with limits regarding the women and it's in contact. I once got in big trouble for telling a new monk not to go become a doctor. He said, yeah, I'm going to go act as a doctor. He's going to go work in a hospital as a monk. And I said, I, I mean, this is a long time ago, and I was a little more uh, sort of brash. So I said, you'll destroy Buddhism. That, that's a way to, you know, it's a, it will cause Buddhism to, I was trying to, to reason with them, saying this is the kind of thing that will lead to the, to the degradation of Buddhism. I use some word like the degradation of the Buddhasasana or the the destruction of the Buddhasasana or something. Oh boy. I didn't realize it at the time, but he kept that. He got very angry. I mean, I didn't know he was angry because he didn't express it. But later on, he caused a big problem. He accused me of things I never did, but made some accusations and trying to get me thrown out of the monastery. And, and and one of the accusations was that I was saying that him becoming a doctor was going to destroy the sass. And I was like, no, yeah, I did say that, and I do believe it. We have monks who teach uh, in schools and universities. I think they are receiving a salary from the government. Yeah, there was a Sri Lankan monk here who was a, a professor in U of, at U of T for a while. I think. So, I mean, I, I thought about that, or I thought about the potential for that, and, and it's actually okay to teach. It's just not okay to receive a salary. salary. And on the other hand, actually, teaching at a university, it, it is a good question. You, know, you teach at a public university, it's not really great because the people are paying to be there. Right. We've talked about this. Is when someone pays to be there, they're suddenly no longer a student. They're now a client. So there's a there's an absence of the respect, which makes it potentially improper to teach. I mean, it's a, it's an argument that I would raise, but I think maybe some people wouldn't raise it. I think it's ridiculous, but I think it's valid that if the students are paying to be there, you know, we've talked about this in the context of meditation. It's not it's not wholesome. It's not it's not perfect. It's not completely right if the students are paying to be there. Not not that the students have done anything wrong, but it's not proper for the monk to, to teach. It's not proper. Right? You could even argue that it's not proper for any Buddhist who respects the Dhamma to teach, to get paid to teach. Now, if you're if you're being if a lay person is being supported by monetary donations, that the students are giving them money to support them. But giving it of their own free will, then that's different. But charging for courses, it was crossing the line, even for a lay person. Sorry, not not that there's something wrong with university students, but when it comes to teaching the Dhamma. Yes, I, I was just going to ask about that. So you're you're not um, saying that if someone is uh, teaching, for for example, uh, physics or something there's anything wrong with it but if if they are charging for uh, the dharma that's wrong i mean it's a very minor thing but i would argue that it's improper you, you could argue it's improper 
Yeah. I would I would ask Buddhists to be to be considerate and to consider whether whether they're that's really respectful. I mean, suppose you're a university professor and you're teaching a class on Buddhism. In a university context, you're not actually going to be. It's not actually considered teaching the Dhamma per se. You're just providing information. It's not the same situation. So I mean, that would be that that would be fine. I think. That's your job, and you're doing this job, and you're not a guru teaching. You're not teaching Buddhists how to be Buddhists. You're teaching students what it, what, it, what Buddhism is about. You know, information. Yeah, because the Buddha preached the Dhamma free of charge and told the monk, "Charata bhikkhu chare kang bahujana itaya bahujana sukha." And then, if they go and sell the Dhamma, is Completely proper. Yeah, but I guess the, the 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 issue of a monk teaching in university is usually not that. It's another. I think of it. It's more filling a role that's improper for a monk because you wouldn't be you would no longer be teaching the Dhamma, spreading the Dhamma. You're now teaching intellectual topics. Even if you taught Buddhism, it would still be in an intellectual context to people who were not even Buddhist or not interested in in practicing Buddhism. Their interest is is is. I mean, it's not ostensibly spiritual. It's like the, the the position you get put in as a professor at a secular university is not proper, I would say. Now, there are, there are Buddhist universities, and you could argue that's different. But I think the monks still get paid at this. Yeah, that interferes with the samadhi. Yeah. But uh, Buddhism is not against uh, science and knowledge, right? Like um, I'm hearing many times Christians say, like science and knowledge is is uh, harm for whatnot. Uh, I can't exactly say what they are saying about it, but uh, many of them don't give their children a proper education, so they don't let them um, learn everything just very various topics like religion well buddhism is a lot more scientific than christianity i think i think that's fair to say obviously it's christians might disagree with that but i think buddhism is a sense is pretty clearly a lot more scientific yeah. but there's still many things that we disagree with a lot of scientists on. Yeah, i, I would scientific. I would I would say as someone who was raised Christian um, and homeschooled and you know taught the you know young Earth creation narrative, I, I think I think from a Buddhist perspective, the things that Christians are against scientifically are, are not really that important because you know the the Buddha you know talks about you know oh where did I come from you know is the world infinite is it not and so forth and, and those are the kind of um, Things that uh, you know Christians like to disagree with scientists over, and no, no, um, but it's, you know, it goes deeper than that. Christians, I mean, it's broad generalization, and I'm not Christian ah. otherwise. But Christians are are generally anti-science in the sense that you're not supposed to understand why Jesus is the path to heaven. You're you're literally ah. supposed to have faith, right? That's and that's literally anti-science or by its very yes. nature anti-science so that's more what i was referring to rather than specific oh. facts or something oh yeah but i i, I was just gonna say i, I think a, a lot of this because that used to be something that I'd, I'd worry about so much like oh my gosh i didn't learn you know this or that in school and you know try and learn everything about it and then being older now it's like a, a lot of it wasn't even anything important but but it, it can vary because uh, like like you said there's there's a lot of different um, Christians out there some of them can be very very anti science or even just you know really outspoken and uh, you know problematic and argumentative even you know over all, all kinds of things. Yeah, I don't know how universal it is, but my sense has been it's has always been it's pretty pretty universal or pretty common for it to be explicitly described as a faith 
who have faith in something, faith in Jesus in some way. That that has nothing to do with the scientific method, and nothing to do with any scientific inquiry. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and I think it's it's very kind of bound up with ignorance to you know say, oh, God is unknowable. It's unknowable. Don't don't ask questions. You know, just have faith. You know, if you you know try to know, you're questioning God, and you know it's, that's like a, a commitment to to ignorance. That that was a very powerful <laughs> sentence. Commitment to ignorance. I, I don't want to come off as offensive when I say it because you know my, my my family still you know it's still very important to them and you know there, there's a lot of aspects of it that I you know still uh, still respect and you know, think are good but uh, you know that 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 side of the religion I just think it, it needs some work. <laughs> Incredible sentence, Sadhu. But isn't that with most um, religions that believe in a creator? So, or is it just well, because we are just talking about Christianity? Well, maybe uh, Hinduism is more. Anyway, we should probably should. We'll, we'll never end if we start talking. When this happens, we get <laughs> on talking about other religions and we never end. The question was about Buddhism. Let's get back to the question about Buddhism. Buddhism is not anti science, but disagrees with. So not only some facts that scientists state as true, uh, but also sort of the, 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 a bit about the scientific method, like in terms of modern science is founded on not trusting your own experiences. And what you trust is that which is impersonal, that which has nothing to do with individual experience. I mean, it's not, it's not universal. There are some branches of science. There are, there's at least one branch of science that tried to argue that uh, first-hand experience can be investigated scientifically, but that's the Buddhist way is first-hand experience, which which does sort of conflict with modern scientific methods. And rightly so. I mean, for many of the, the things that science looks at, like on a material level, cannot because they cannot be, be experienced. It's all sort of kind of abstract ideas about matter, like gravity or physics and so on, things that, that are not directly experience experienceable. Your experiences are going to be distorted. Like time, for example. Time is easily distorted, or your perception of time is easily distorted. But Buddhism doesn't even care about any of that stuff. Buddhism is only interested in what is objectively experienceable, the six senses, and the fact that they are impermanent, that they arise and cease, and what that signifies. Very simple things that are experienceable. That's all for me this week. And I would thank you, thank you for coming. Thank you, Bhante. Yeah. Thank you, Bhante. Uh, yeah. Thank you. 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 Thank you.